Welcome to the Pod of Inquiry, pushing the envelope for human understanding and optimization, the podcast for podiatrists. The Pod of Inquiry is designed to empower you with knowledge. What happens from there is up to you. Your host, Dr. Stephen Barrett, has designed this show to take you down some very deep rabbit holes, hopefully bringing you back out again, relatively unscathed, but cerebrally whipped, enabling a better understanding of all things worthy of inquiry. If you have more questions after the show, then that is good. The new discovery today many times was the new discovery 50 years ago, only to be suppressed or plainly ignored. Medicine and surgery can sometimes take a long while to get their paradigm shifted. We hope to have a lot of fun on this show and maybe destroy some ridiculous dogma along the journey. Thanks for joining the show today. Let's start spelunking. I'm really excited to have my great nerve fellow, Dr. Artender Nagra, with me today, where we discuss hydro dissection. And uh, we get into some pretty cool things. I've had a lot of uh, people inquire about where they can get training in this, how we do it, um, those types of things. And in this episode, we talk about the mechanisms of action of hydro dissection, particularly with D5W. We go into the Bennett model of nerve compression, uh, which is an interesting thing and, and has pertinence not only in hydrodissection, but really any peripheral nerve condition. Uh, and we talk about different uh, nerves in the lower extremity as far as what is the best for hydrodissection versus where we've had uh, more failure or less than uh, ideal optimal outcomes. And then we talk about the technique itself and what's important when you do do a hydrodissection. And then uh, Dr. Nagra presents a couple of case examples that I think you'll find very good. So uh, without any further introduction, please enjoy this episode with my nerve fellow, Dr. Artender Nagra. I'm here this morning with my very esteemed nerve fellow, Dr. Artender Nagra. And uh, what are we going to talk about today? I am very excited about what we're talking about today, and it's called hydrodissection. I've heard of it. I think I've heard a little bit about it too. Yeah. No, I'm excited about hydro dissection. We're having a lot of uh, comments and questions from the listeners about when they can learn this technique. And by the time this episode airs, we will have already um, had our first training session in hydro dissection, but we'll be holding more throughout the year. So let's get into hydro dissection. I guess let's uh, define it. How, how would you define it? from what you've seen versus what's in the literature, that type of thing. Hydrodissection is really a technique where you try to separate any sort of scar tissue that might be adhering down the nerve, and you try to separate the nerve from um, that tissue. So essentially, the scar tissue is entrapping the nerve. And so the hydrodissection is putting a great amount of fluid to try to separate all that, break up that scar tissue in a sense and separate it from the nerve. So there's different things that we can use to perform a hydrodissection. One of the questions I always get is, well, what do you use? Uh, we use D5W, but other people will you just will use sometimes just normal saline or local anesthetic. But um, there's a reason that we like D5W. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But before we get into why we select D5W, let's talk about the mechanism of action of how hydrodissection is thought to work. Right. So uh, essentially, the nerve is also surrounded by its own supply of blood vessels, the vasonevorum, and it's also su- actually has its own supply of tiny little nerves as well the uh, nervi nevorum. And so the purpose of uh, the hydrodissection is to essentially um, get those nerves to um, dilate, uh, basically get those nerves to waken up. uh, Because if you can dilate the blood vessels around the nerve by basically preventing them from being pinched. Um, If you say that the nerve is adhered down and you're doing a hydrodissection to separate the nerve from its 
um, entrapment. Uh, when you do that, you're also opening up the blood vessels around it, the vasonervorum, and you're um, getting the increased blood flow to the nervinervorum also on the nerve, which in turn allows um, uh, basically better function. Um, the nervinervorum innervate and regulate the function of the nerve. So if you can um, basically increase their function, you can increase the function of the whole nerve itself. So a lot of this concept came from what's called the Bennett animal model of nerve compression, I believe. And what Bennett did was took uh, rat nerves, I think, and put a uh, an absorbable suture around them, but very light compression. It wasn't like he was just cinching down this ligam or this ligature on the uh, on the nerve, and specifically looked at the sciatic nerve. Basically, what uh, Bennett was able to show is that very light constriction on the nerve, um, with just the minimalist of effort, led to um, very significant um, development of hyperesthesia, allodynia, and also um, led to some pretty significant and rapid morphological changes within the nerve itself. So conceptually, and we'll get to this a little bit more when we talk about what nerve selection, what patient selection we kind of look at from a hydrodissection uh, standpoint and indications, but basically what Bennett showed in his studies was that it doesn't take a whole lot for this nerve to function improperly and to be, you know, significantly pathologic. Um, and that by removing this, this light compression, or maybe in some cases, as we've seen, even very significant scar, uh, scar tissue contracture around the nerve, that we can experience in many patients a uh, reduction or elimination of their symptoms. So just to follow back up on it, we have the mechanical release. So the infiltrate itself is separating this tight tissue from the nerve. The second mechanism that is theorized is that after that occurs, then it'll allow for this nerve to have an increased mobility that it wasn't having. And so this traction on the nerve uh, was maybe leading to some of this light compression as well. There was talk about lymphatic drainage and the effect on the lymphatics. Do you want to touch on that a little bit? Because I think it's another legitimate um, right. so aspect. The, lymph the lymphatic drainage is obviously outside the epineurium. And so um, it's still subject to the compressive effects occurring around the nerve because everything's in a very confined space. You have the nerve, the blood vessels around it, the small nerves around it, and then outside of the nerve, there's the lymph lymphatic system. And so um, as long you're not only separating the nerve from the scar tissue or its entrapment site, but you're also freeing up uh, the vessels, the normal vessels, such as the lymphatics and the veins around that tissue as well. And so um, your, uh, the lymphatic system is subject to compression. So you're freeing up that. Uh, so it's able to um, perform its function of draining excess fluid. So there are certain things we know predisposing that can predispose nerves to compression and even this light compression. And um, one of those is just very, very simply is that when the, the nerve is trying to move and it can't, then because of the surrounding scar tissue, then that can lead to another additional layer of entrapment or compression because this nerve is trying to to glide and it can't so an excessive strain or stress is being put on this nerve axially that could lead to some of the neuropathic um, symptom development and the other uh, thing that has been seen is that when these nerves will scar a lot of times they'll scar down next to a bony prominence and that bony prominence then can act as an, a common irritant for um, you know, that obviously that, that nerve, if it's altered in its vector way, the way it's moving around this, uh, this bony prominence, then that can, you know, effectively cause, a, a another, let's call it a mechanically irritating, um, 
factor for that nerve as well. Um, we know that um, this happens with the common perineal nerve or common fibular nerve at the level of the fibular neck from inversion ankle sprains, these types of things where that nerve just gets tweaked around a, uh, a bony prominence. In this case, it'd be the neck of the fibula. But that in and of itself then can set up for further uh, development of problems with further scarring because the nerve is already predisposed uh, to any secondary effect that may come along. Absolutely. Um, it's a good point you made about, you know, we've been talking about the nerve being around scar tissue or soft tissue in general, but um, it, it can be around a bony prominence. And so it, it's good to touch upon that as well. well. Let's talk about why we like D5W versus normal saline or a local anesthetic. So D5W uh, in the literature um, is noted to be similar um, so it's basically a sugar molecule, right? Um, and they've done studies where they've, they found mannitol, which is a sugar molecule to reduce the burning sensation after exposure to capsaicin. So it's a calming effect on the trip V1 or the TRP V1 channel. Um, and so dextrose is similar in structure to mannitol and it's observed to have a similar effect. Essentially it's, um, it's supposed to, um, again, have a calming effect on the trip V1 upregulation. Um, so, so it works on that channel. So by suppressing trip V1 hyperexcitability, yes, then it's decreasing that nociceptive input to the central nervous system. Right. So we have mechanical action and we have chemical action now. Now, theoretically, with normal saline, we would only have mechanical action and the same with local anesthetic. Now, the problem with local anesthetic is if you're using a high volume of local anesthetic, then you have to start worrying about toxicity, especially with something like bupivacaine. Whereas with D5W, we've administered 40, 50, sometimes 60 cc's of this fluid to, to achieve our hydrodissection, uh, which couldn't be done with just a regular local anesthetic just Absolutely. from volume standpoint, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So let's talk about the clinical experience that we've had because we've had some really great successes and, you know, and other patients we've had, you know, less than ideal. But I think to preface before we start talking about some of the outcomes and, and some of our selection criteria, I think the important thing is, is that, you know, we've been hydrodissecting now for two and a half, three years, and we have not had a complication, knock on wood. Um, I think if the technique is used judiciously and, you know, with proper training, then an understanding of peripheral nerve and, and peripheral neuroanatomy, uh, I think it's a very safe um, intervention. And then that offsets, if, you're, if your risk is low, you're willing to intervene in cases where you may not think that you'll have an ultimate outcome, but it's worth a try because in some patients as we've seen where we've kind of held out that, you know, this probably won't do anything substantively for you. Uh, it has. And so the selection criteria sometimes will include patients because of the minimal risk associated with the technique that we wouldn't necessarily put in the selection criteria of some other more invasive procedure where they may not be an, a, an ideal candidate. And, you know, so your costs versus benefits are, it's different with hydrodissection than it is with, let's say, a revision tarsal tunnel surgery. So, I mean, we've seen very significant benefits in patients that have had a failed tarsal tunnel without having to go back and revise that tarsal tunnel, which you know as well as everybody who does peripheral nerve, that your success rate starts to plummet the second time that you go in on a tarsal tunnel. So if you can get something turned around with something like hydrodissection, that makes a hell of a lot of sense, and you're not risking the patient, and maybe preventing a surgery that doesn't have the ideal optimal outcome that a, a primary nerve compression would. So Right. Yeah. It, and it gives the patient um, some reassurance that surgery is not their only option. 
it's it's like you said it's a non-invasive method and it there's really uh, no side effect to it so it, i definitely think it's worth trying but uh, another thought that i had we've been discussing um you know mostly that the nerve is entrapped because of scar tissue um, what about the patients that have had a, no previous surgery and have had a trauma to the mm. nerve and it's it's not that the nerve is cut but um, maybe they have an aroma in situ and uh, it's been you know a few years and um, they don't want surgery um, is it still a good option to do a hydrodissection to a nerve that's had some sort of trauma but it's it's not been severe trauma to the point where the nerve is cut by any means yeah well i mean you know we just talked about bennett's model where mm -hmm. it's really a very low degree of mechanical insult to sometimes create a high degree of chronic pain for a patient so uh yeah i think that makes a lot of sense and and uh you know it doesn't the more i am involved in the peripheral nerve world the the more i realize it doesn't take a big event to sometimes cause a big event and from a nerve standpoint and um, so if you have a contusion obviously there's some scar tissue around the the nerve at that spot so the vasonevorum and the nervi nevorum are going to be compromised so it makes a lot of sense to go ahead and try with a uh, hydrodissection um, well let's talk about selection right because you and i have seen in our experience that sometimes the condition is associated with really fantastic outcomes and then another condition may not have as good of a success rate so i think the first area where i would say that this is a really strong powerful technique is in revisions of painful scars and i think you're going to show a case example later uh, of a deep perineal nerve but there's not a lot of tissue on the dorsum of the foot that's an easy area to get to from a hydrodissection standpoint. Voles tend to do really pretty well. Um, whereas if I was gonna pick one area that I would say has less potential for, for great outcomes with hydrodissection, not that it won't have great outcomes in some patients, but uh, that would be you know stuff with the medial plantar, lateral plantar nerve, just because of the amount of biomechanical force that's going through there. Um, I think more proximally, superficial perineal or superficial fibular nerve entrapments, common perineal nerve, common fibular uh, nerve entrapments, these are going to probably be more successful, generally speaking, than something on the plantar aspect of the foot or even in the tarsal tunnel itself, just because of the adverse biomechanical demand that's going on in those areas. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. I think that's a great point that you brought up because patient selection is a very important aspect of this. Um, and you're absolutely correct in that uh, I don't believe I've yet hydrodissected anybody with a scar on the plantar aspect just because of the biomechanical force, as you mentioned. It's, it, we walk on our feet, it's hard to stay off of them. And, and most of the time um, when you do these, there's a large amount of fluid going in an area. So you have to do it where uh, there's no pressure because otherwise it may create an imbalance or, you know, some of these patients have neuropathy. So if we're putting a large amount of fluid, it's creating pressure, but some of them may not feel it. So they're kind of walking around um, with essentially a, a bolus of fluid on the bottom of their foot. It doesn't make any sense to do it in that area for that reason, just because of the amount of fluid you're putting in there. It needs to be in an area where um, the, the patient isn't going to be putting any pressure on it. I agree. Well, people ask me, well, what about technique? And so we're going to talk a little bit about technique. Um, I think the most important thing as with anything is to do no harm. And I think where you have potential for harm is if the injection technique that you utilize during this, uh, hydrodissection, um, if, if your technique is not pristine, then there is more of a likelihood that you could potentially injure a, uh, a peripheral nerve um, not wanting to do that. But I think the, the whole concept here is that 
it's not the needle that's doing the work. It's the infiltrate that's doing the work. So what we like to do is, is anesthetize the skin with a 30 gauge, a little bit of Lido. And that kind of allows us then to introduce either a 25 or a 22 gauge. Most of the time we're using 25 or 27. Um, I've found though, personally with the 27, it's the pressure is so hard. And especially in, in a patient that has a tremendous amount of scar tissue that the 27 just isn't gonna do it for you. But let's say we're routinely using a 25 gauge um, the concept is once you get through the skin, <clears throat> then you want to have your infiltrate always precede the bevel of your needle. And that way you're not going to hurt vasculature. You're not going to hurt these peripheral nerves because the fluid is pushing things out of the way. That's the critical aspect of performance of hydrodissection is that you have to make sure that you're not just putting this needle in and damaging a structure, but you're putting the needle in just subcutaneously, and then you're letting the infiltrate do the work. It's doing the dissection. The needle is not doing the dissection. And they, uh, you know, it's really imperative that you do this with ultrasound visualization uh, because you can see the nerve it, it, itself pretty well, and that uh, uh, you're going to be aware of the structures. And interesting, we'll see sometimes they won't have a. Uh, an artery in that area where we're hydrodissecting. And then after we hydrodissect, lo and behold, what happens? There's an artery in the There's area. There's an artery, right? So right. that indicates that, and you can see this with your color flow and your Doppler, but that indicates that, hey, I'm getting a good enough uh, decompression here that now this artery is able to flow through this scar tissue. Um, and you should be able to extrapolate from that, that if you're seeing an artery develop that was just compressed uh, arterial flow i should say then you could pretty much you know say that well my nerve is probably going to get a pretty fair amount of decompression as well so technique wise i think it's very important i think sometimes people get freaked out too you we're using high volumes i mean i've put 30 cc's in on the dorsum of a foot it looks like a, a egg has just been set on the top of the foot and it's kind of a little bit of a freak out for for the patient sometimes if they're not educated uh, but we tell them listen you know within two three hours four hours body resorbs all of that fluid and they can't tell that they've had anything done all of the sponsors of this podcast are listed on the website at podofinquiry.com. You can get great offers on these fantastic products and services, and this will help generate revenue for the show so that we can bring you the absolute best content. Thank you all for listening and supporting the show. Several years ago, I chose Alpinion as my ultrasound brand of choice after years of experience and research into ultrasound imaging. In fact, I have two of their machines. Alpinion has incredible precision and penetration built into their technology that, in my opinion, is simply the best value in all of the ultrasound imaging space. They have several price points to meet your needs, and I can tell you definitively that you'll end up having to pay double to achieve the equivalent imaging quality from other top brands. That doesn't even account for the unlimited software updates and remote tech support included with no monthly fees right now to show their appreciation for the listeners of the pod of inquiry they're offering an incredible discount their portable i7 retails for $21,000 but you can get it discounted at most medical meetings for $19,000 but my listeners will get it discounted to $15,900 this has never been offered anywhere for the new portable system with the engine of a console system Use code SBPOI to take advantage of this incredible offer. You won't be disappointed with Alpinion. I sure haven't been. Well, let's talk about some case examples that you have today so uh, people can get an idea of what we're doing. Sure. So the first case I have is a 57-year-old male with history of you know, some uh, nerve decompressions, and he's had quite extensive uh, common peroneal, superficial peroneal, deep peroneal, and tarsal tunnel in both his legs um, just uh, last year. And he's, but now he's coming back and he's complaining of tingling and sharp pain in the dorsal peroneal nerve area around the scar in both his feet. Um, so, this 
I wanted to showcase this example because here's somebody who we've done surgery on and he's had the decompression, but he's still having this lingering tingling and um, some pain in the area of the decompressed nerve. So it goes to show you that this is still beneficial because maybe um, even after surgery, the whole point is to um, get that nerve to glide freely in the tissue that even after you do surgery, it's still encased in scar tissue. Some patients form more scar tissue than others, and it depends on how they manage themselves postoperatively um, to prevent that. But in the, at the end of the day, they've still got scar tissue even after our surgery. So what do you do? This is a good option. Um, so here we um, see here, we're trying to locate our scar. And here's the scar for the surgery. And here is his um, kind of his point of tenderness. Um, and that's what we're trying to locate on this patient is where is it the most painful for you? But even after we find that, you'll see it's not that you, you, the hydrodisect just at that point, you'll see that the fluid will in, infiltrate kind of everywhere around the scar. It's not, um, just that one area. So here I've included some images of the ultrasound, of that patient's foot. So uh, again, we're looking at the deep peroneal nerve. So here we've located it by finding the dorsalis pedis artery and the nerve is um, right next to it. And here on the next picture, I'm showcasing now uh, that uh, we've um, trying to find our needle within uh, the ultrasound so that we know where we are. And that's what I'm showing here is that first you identify the anatomy and then you identify yourself within the anatomy. Um, and then the next image, I have a small video is, um, our, our needle is in the place that we want it. And now we're going to infiltrate and you'll see very nicely how that fluid is just pushing the surrounding tissue. It's amazing how the tissue planes will just separate. Absolutely. And then um, I have another video of that same patient. So we're still continuing to hydrodissect and you can see how much fluid is in this tissue plane at this point and how much the, the it, it's how much the body will allow you. So you can go in there saying, you know, have a 30 cc needle drawn up, but if the body only allows you 20, then that's how much, um, it can take. So this patient, surprisingly enough, um, you could see that the fluid is spreading quite easily within his tissues. And, um, I believe, let me interrupt mm -hmm. there because this brings to mind one question that I get frequently, and that's how much do I give? How much do I infiltrate? And the answer is enough. All right. So we're not worried about toxicity, right? With D5W. I mean, I could put literally a whole IV bag in the patient and it wouldn't cause any detriment. Right. But when you're doing this, you want to start either proximally or distally in an area of, let's call it relatively normal anatomy where it's not scarred down. And then you want to continue that hydro dissection until you get to another area of where the infiltrate doesn't have a lot of resistance. And you can tell this very easily on the ultrasound. The other thing that we try to do that I, I, I like to tell people is let the patient watch the ultrasound because it's very powerful for them to see these tissue planes develop that hadn't been there before. And conceptually, it gives them an idea. This is what's going on. This is what's being done for me today. Right, absolutely. Um, and that's a, a good question. Um, a good point that you illustrated there. So um, going back to what we were talking about before is it looks like someone put an egg on the top of his foot in this picture is because that's just this area is not that much, does not have that much soft tissue. It's very, has a lot of osseous prominence here. So you can see the fluid is seen more easily than if you were to inject this in an area with a lot of soft tissue. The top of the foot just doesn't have that much. So the fluid appears more prominent. Um, but again, it's all about educating the patient. So let, this is a great example for me to interject one more thing, because from a technique standpoint, people will ask, well, how do I place this needle in relationship to the nerve that I'm trying to hydrodissect? 
ideally, if you can be in plane, meaning that your uh, needle is adjacent and parallel to that nerve, that's going to be very ideal. But there are some cases, but in like the dorsal aspect of the foot, virtually almost everything in the lower extremity can be um, attacked via an in plane or where the needle is parallel to the, the nerve that you're trying to address. Uh, but sometimes you'll have to come in from an out of plane technique, which means not necessarily out of plane with the transducer of the ultrasound, but out of plane with the, the course of that neuroanatomy. So you're perpendicular or semi perpendicular to that nerve with your needle. And um, that you have to be a little bit more careful with because if you advance that needle and you're perpendicular to the nerve, you could very easily impale the nerve. But with a end plane where you're parallel to it, once you've established that, you have a little a higher degree of safety. So go, go ahead. So here, um, as we were talking about how much, this patient could only, his, his tissue in that area could only take about 10 cc's of 5% de dextrose. So even if, we wanted to, we couldn't inject that, that much because the tissue will give you back pressure. Um, and the tissue won't really allow you to inject any more as we did on this patient. Um, 10 cc's was all he could take and, and we couldn't inject any more than that. Yeah. I kind of want to get a caulking gun, <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, because some of the pressure, I mean, it's just literally more than your, your, your thumb and two fingers can overcome absolutely I mean, it gets it's, quite difficult oh yeah. yeah yeah it's like the patient tolerates the procedure really well but the administrator's worn out and has cramps in their finger and and thumb absolutely. for a, a day or two but uh yeah so uh i think you said five cc's of ten percent five cc's of ten percent of five ten cc's of five, five percent yes. dextrose in water yes it's easy to get these things confused and we haven't even been drinking yet <laughs> Maybe we should start drinking. <laughs> then then I think we'll really mix up the numbers. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> go ahead. So keep going. This is good stuff. Um, all righty. So let's go on to the next case there. Of uh, Now, this is a 59-year-old male with history of saphenous nerve decompression. So again, he's had a decompression on the medial left foot, and he's still complaining of a nail stuck in his foot only in one spot. Um, so here I'm going to show you the, this is what the scar looks like, but you can see I've outlined just one area. This is it. This is where he feels it. N not anywhere proximal. It's just in this one area. Give me some orientation here. I'm trying to figure out which way is which here. Sure. So this is towards his toes. Okay. Gotcha. This way. This okay. is distal. And, um, this is going up to his ankle. All right. So and this was a previous saphenous? Yes. Saphenous okay. nerve decompression in this area. All right. Um, and so just in this one spot, he says he's having pain. So we've isolated that spot. And what we're going to do next is um, locate the nerve. So the saphenous nerve is obviously a smaller nerve. So again, the best thing to do these nerves like to travel with blood vessels, and, and that's what we've done here is we found that blood vessel and the nerve is right next to it. Um, in the next image here, I've shown uh, pre-infiltration what the scar tissue looks like in that area. And once we've infiltrated, you can see very nicely in this image how that scar tissue is broken up. Um, and this is an instance where uh, we tried um, to stay uh, as distally as possible along the incision, uh, just because uh, that's where we visualize the most amount of scar tissue. So let's uh, let's just briefly interject um, on saphenous because saphenous is an interesting nerve. I've seen more of them injured from vein ablation surgeries than probably any other thing that maybe contusions, but it, it's a small nerve, doesn't necessarily have this well-defined normal tunnel that it goes through like all of the other nerves except the sural, but we can talk about that at another time because the sural nerve is uh, it's an interesting character. Uh, but really from a saphenous standpoint, the only tunnel that you have 
for it to, to become entrapped is the adductor canal up in the, the medial thigh, uh, where it turns from femoral to saphenous. So distally, it's relatively clean of normal anatomical tunnels. However, for some reason in certain vein ablation techniques, and I don't know this to be true in the literature, but this is definitely true in my clinical experience. And that is, is that it seems like uh, there is less saphenous nerve injury with radiofrequency ablation, vein ablation surgery, mm -hmm. than with laser. Mm -hmm. I don't know why that is, but that's just an observation that I've made. So um, anyhow, so go ahead, uh, keep going with this. This is great stuff. So I'm just going to go back. Um, so the one thing I wanted to highlight about uh, this as well is that um, we were talking about the saphenous nerve. It, also, it's purely sensory. So the fact that um, he's feeling that that nail stuck in his foot feeling, um, it hasn't really been going away since we've done the decompression. So it, it you know, the, if you do just a decompression on the saphenous nerve, is it enough? It's, uh, it's purely a sensory nerve. So it um, maybe it needs an additive uh, effect of something else. And so I think that's what we were trying to do here is even after the decompression, we're trying to hydrodissect the area and get that nerve to glide more freely um, because it's because it's purely sensory, it's going to keep sending those um, signals to the brain that uh, this patient is experiencing um, this nail stuck in his feeling. But uh, it, theoretically, it should have gotten better after the decompression, but it hasn't. So it goes to show you that this nerve is very tricky in trying to manage as well. well let's go back to mm -hmm. the, the actual photo of the uh, patient's foot, because I wanted to make a comment on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So where you've got the little uh, blue marks and the circle, that, that was the area where he was having the nail-like feeling? Yes. Okay. What was his, What caused this issue to begin with? That, I know this case you and Dr. Ducasse did. Right. Um, um, so I believe uh, in the beginning, to be honest with you, I um, don't recall uh, his medical history per se, but I know he's a non-diabetic patient and he had some kind of uh, surgery done in this area uh, previously. And um, I want to say um, I, uh, some sort of maybe possibly... A procedure related to a bunion and so it, he's had um, tenderness and tingling in this area to begin with and so I think we went ahead and decompressed the saphenous nerve um, in that area just because of um, you know again because of his previous surgery possible compression of that nerve just because it doesn't travel in a tunnel doesn't mean it can't be compressed by scar tissue so it was decompressed um, but he's still having this lingering feeling afterwards. Well, if you look at this photo where he's complaining of the, the nail like feeling, you can see the scar tissue is radically different in that part of the scar than proximal where the scar has healed pretty well. So I mean, right. it, this picture I think sh shows a perfect example of why hydrodissection is indicated because this nerve was decompressed Absolutely. and it just scarred down in that one area a little bit more than, than it did proximally and distally. Saphenous doesn't have a lot of tissue to hang around in underneath the skin either, you right. know? So it's kind of like the surl in a way sometimes. It doesn't have a whole lot of uh, uh, soft tissue surrounding it to protect it. It's right. skin, nerve, bone type oh, right. of thing. Uh, so how did he do? He did, he did actually uh, quite well uh, for a little while. Um, I just wanted to mention, he, he used to have hardware here, I think from the fusion, I think he had a bunion fusion here, uh, approximately at the TMT. And so he used to have hardware in there. The hardware was removed and that's after he saw us after that. And that's when we did the decompression, but he did quite well for a little while. Um, and then he sort of started to have, uh, the pain again. Um, that's the thing about hydrodissection. You kind of have to see how long it works for you. So sometimes, you know, the hydrodissection can work for six months, but in some patients it only works for one month. So then it kind of leads you 
to, you know, either these patients are going to come back just regularly for them, or maybe this is not a long-term solution for them. And he was one of those patients where it worked for about a month, but then it came back. So it wasn't the long-term solution he was looking for. But there's a lot of patients that that, that I've had that will give them a second, sometimes even a third round of hydro, and they do very well because mm-hmm. it's a nice technique from the standpoint that it doesn't lay you up. I mean, right. they leave with maybe a Band-Aid and back into the regular shoe unless I put a 60 cc egg on the top of their foot and then they're back in the shoe and you know right. that afternoon or the next morning. But um, I think that's an important point to make is that sometimes you need to do more than one hydro dissection. Right. Where they'll say, yeah, oh, it worked for a temporary period of time, or you'll have patients like this sometimes that'll say, yeah, you know, in this this area, it's done really well, but now I've got still a little tightness or a little unusual right. feeling distal, and you'll go, or proximal, and you'll go and you'll hit that area, right? Right. right. So. Yeah, this patient's a little bit unique because his pain keeps coming back to that area, weirdly enough, and I think it's the way... Um, as you pointed out, the scar is contracted in that area. So um, uh, it came back to that specific area again. So, um, but uh, let me go on to the next patient. So this is a 49 year old male with history of peroneal tendon repair, relatively healthy guy. um, But just because of his previous surgery, he's complaining of tingling, burning in this, just in the sural nerve distribution, all on the the lateral aspect, definitely along that scar itself. So we were talking about the saphenous nerve here is another sensory nerve, the sural nerve. Again, it's not supposed to be traveling in a tunnel, but uh, with both of these nerves, they're just, they both had had previous surgeries. These nerves are now encased in scar tissue. So they're really good candidates for hydrodissection. Here's another image I have Again, you want to orient yourself and make sure you're in the proper area. So we're along that. um, We actually went here, I believe, a little bit proximal to the scar to find the nerve, um, to make sure we've located the nerve, and then we move distally known to unknown. And then here, um, I want to showcase us starting proximally in this picture. So th- this is a patient where we've really hydrodissected him along its length, and we start proximally um, because we wanted to locate the nerve, and we wanted to start in um, in the area where it's probably a little bit of less scar tissue going to more scar tissue. So I'm going to show the video here. And you can see how the fluid is separating out the surrounding tissue right here. Very nice. And it's pushing everything apart. And so that um, starting proximally and then moving distal. So here you can see that we encountered a lot more scar tissue distally. Um, I just want to point out this is the area of the patient's ankle. So that's where we were approximately. Now we're moving towards the toes. And the needle has changed here now just because of the amount of pressure that's in this area. Um, and I believe um, we were able to inject more. Um, it was an easier way to inject with this. So let me show you the video. And again, all you could see a lot of scar tissue down here. And you could see the fluid still trying to push that scar tissue out. And I believe, um, and he also had a lot at the end of the day, I want to say you could see my needle. It, we had about 30 cc's and you can see here it's coming down to five. I believe he took the 30 cc's of the dextrose, um, and he was able to tolerate it. Well, again, they're always going to feel like a feeling of being full in that area in a sense. A lot of pressure in that area but again it's about educating them and that it's it's not meant to last but it's not painful right it's, it's just pressure because you have a lot of fluid there right and i think the fact that we're only anesthetizing the skin and we're really not trying to you know give them a, a real heavy block in that area is somewhat protective for them as well because if they're still sensate and you get close to a nerve they're going to get a neuropraxia 
Right. And so that kind of like, oh, all right, I'm touching the nerve. I don't want to touch the nerve. I want to just be right next to the nerve. And right. and so I think that's a, a little bit of a, a benefit in technique. Um, I think that if, um, you know, if your patient is not really, there are some people that are just tremendously phobic of, of any needle or anything like that. They're probably going to need some kind of, you know, pseudo sedative, usually some Valium or something before to calm them down a little bit. But most people do really well with this. And I think, you know, that you don't really have to put in a lot of local anesthetic. So absolutely, um, that's a benefit. Uh, in, in my little experience, I've seen, um, you know, a lot of patients with previous tarsal tunnel syndrome, uh, injury or tarsal tunnel surgery, I would say they do really well with these as uh, as well, as long as you stay in the tarsal tunnel area, not necessarily by the medial plantar and lateral plantar, but if you're uh, in the tarsal tunnel or a little bit proximal, mm -hmm. um, it, they do really well um, as well. Um, here we've showcased, I just wanted to summarize, um, we've showcased uh, the sural nerve, we've showcased the saphenous nerve, and in the beginning we showcased the deep peroneal nerve, but these are just a few examples um, but we've even done hydrodissection in the intermetatarsal nerves. Mm -hmm. um, yep. Yeah. Uh, people have asked me, well, what about Morton's neuroma? And the first thing I said, well, it's not a damn neuroma. It's an entrapment. Unless you've cut it out, then it's a recurrent Morton's neuroma. Uh, but I'm not going to get on that soapbox <laughs> now. You know, I've been yelling that from the top of the mountain for 30 plus years. Uh, nobody's listening. But um, uh, yeah, no, I think this has been a good summary of, of hydro dissection. It's a very powerful technique. It's, it's supremely powerful when you factor in the fact that you don't have to admit them for outpatient procedure. Their day-to-day -day activity is not altered really at all. And, uh, you know, it, in the right situation, it, the outcomes are really very, very powerful. Uh, one thing I wanted to clear up is that, you know, sometimes there is a temporary where they'll come back and they'll say, yeah, it lasted a week or it lasted a month. But we've had patients that, you know, we've hydro dissected years ago, a couple years ago, and they're fine. They're, you know, and I think that once you do the hydro, you have to encourage these patients mobilization. You want the nerve to start gliding again. So it's not necessarily that it's just a temporary. In some patients, it's a totally permanent procedure for Absolutely. them. And in others, it's temporary and they may need to come in for a hydro periodically. Uh, but most of them are willing to do, you know, that because of the minimal involvement on, on you know, the post procedure um, encumbrance that, you know, you don't have with if, let's say you're doing an open nerve decompression and, and you know, an open surgery. So, right. um, I think that's, you know, some consideration. And they, you'll actually see this. So we were talking about the scar tissue. You'll, when they initially present to you, it'll be, you know, very hard, firm. And once you patients, let's say who've had this done twice, you can, you yourself can feel the fluidity of the tissues. Right. Yeah. You created some elasticity. Yeah. You've created a little success that can begin to have more success with the subsequent right treatment and, right. and that's a great point that you brought up there uh so anything else that we need to talk about hydro dissection i think that was a great uh clinical presentation and and a good discussion um i don't i no, think we I, covered a lot yeah i i think the only if i had to say caveat to this would be you have to be familiar again with ultrasound and you have to make sure you have practice uh, knowing where you are, right? It, looking at, you have to have a good ultrasound where you can visualize these nerves and making sure um, you can visualize your vessels. And I think um, user uh, ability is key here, uh, how proficient someone is in uh, ultrasound. Right. Yeah. Well, and, and you know, just a, a good thorough understanding of neuroanatomy is very beneficial. Uh, well, that leads into how I want to wrap this up because I've had, like I said at the beginning of the show, we've had a lot of people like, hey, how can I learn this? Um, and the answer is you can go to our website, potofinquiry.com, and under the education tab, you'll be able to find some of the courses listed there. And uh, we'll be holding more hydro dissection courses throughout the year. I've got two courses up now, uh, Heel Pain Boot Camp 3.0, uh, which is a fantastic course. And uh, uh, another one on just uh, uh, ultrasound guided um, 
injections and musculoskeletal uh, ultrasound, which is critical for even, you know, almost every practice. But um, in those courses, there's a dedicated section for hydro dissection as well, because it is a very powerful technique. And I think more people should be using it. Absolutely. I agree. And um, I hope more people will. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming up to Jasper today on this rainy day. Um, I can't be out on the tractor, so hell, I'd rather be in here with you uh, talking about nerve, right? <laughs> Absolutely. So it's always two, a fun My two day. favorite things, tractors and nerve. nerves. <laughs> yeah. So, all right. Well, thanks so much. And uh, thank you all for listening to this uh, week's show. We hope you all enjoyed today's show and got some truly empowering knowledge out of it. You can always follow up on anything we talked about in the show notes found at our website, potofinquiry.com. If this incredible and educational conversation has tickled just a little bit of your cortex, please leave us a review and spread the message to your friends and colleagues. Let's keep spelunking. This podcast is designed for informational purposes only. It does not constitute any medical or surgical consulting advice or imply a development of any physician-patient relationship. The opinions of guests who are featured on the show are not necessarily the opinions of Dr. Barrett or the production team. This podcast is owned solely by Barrett Medical and Surgical Media, LLC. While the show is highly oriented for physicians and healthcare providers, anyone interested in the improvement of human performance and understanding will find us a welcome goblet to sip from or guzzle. However, no representation or warranties are made in any way whatsoever on this podcast for any products, techniques, or other things discussed. Invited guests are not vetted by the pot of inquiry for their qualifications and may have a direct or indirect financial interest in what they present and discuss on the show. The Pond of Inquiry disclaims any responsibility from anything taken from the show and used personally or professionally. It is a responsibility of the listener to perform their own due diligence prior to the implementation of any ideas, products, techniques, or anything talked about on the show.